Well, let's move on to talk about some of these uh, newer agents that have uh, just recently been approved. Uh, I'll lead off with a, a talk a little bit about um, uh, FAM Trastuzumab Deruxtecan, also known as DS8201A. Um, this is a new antibody drug conjugate, so it's in the same family, uh, same drug class as TDM1, but it has some unique uh, differences as compared to TDM1. Um, it does have a trastuzumab biosimilar as its backbone, so the amino acid sequence is identical to trastuzumab uh, and TDM1, uh, so it is humanized. It's an IgG1 uh, backbone antibody. Um, the linker is different. And rather than a stable linker, this is a cleavable peptide-based linker. And the payload is unique. Rather than a microtubule interacting agent like derivative of metanzin 1, this payload is a topo-1 inhibitor, topoisomerase 1. Moreover, the um, drug-to-antibody ratio is different than TDM1. In the case of TDM1, it's about three DM1 molecules per trastuzumab backbone. But in the case of uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan, it's about eight, so it has more of the topo-1 payload per antibody molecule as compared to TDM1. And then finally, the other interesting attribute about the topo-1 inhibitor payload of trastuzumab deruxtecan is that in contrast to DDM, TDM1, where DM1 is insoluble, it is incapable of killing any neighboring cells even after it's released from dead or dying cells, uh, it has no bystander effect, whereas the trastuzumab deruxtecan payload, topo-1 inhibitor, has a potent bystander effect and can kill adjacent tumor cells, even if they're HER2 negative, at least in the laboratory, for instance. So it's a really interesting molecule. And um, as you know, the results from the first non-randomized phase two, yet pivotal FDA registrational trial, uh, have recently been published just this year by Modi and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is called the DESTINY-01 trial. 184 patients who had had a median, a median of uh, six previous treatments uh, received trastuzumab deruxtecan at the FDA-approved dose and schedule of 5.4 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks intravenously. And in the intent to treat analysis, a response to therapy was reported in 112 of those patients. That's about a 61% response rate from a single agent in heavily pretreated HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. That was the most uh, impressive waterfall plot I've ever seen uh, in breast cancer anyway, when that was presented on that phase two trial. Absolutely right. I mean, this is uh, the most active single agent HER2 targeted therapy yet developed. It's the most incredible waterfall plot I've seen. I call it the waterfall plot that looks like uh, Victoria Falls <laughs> was there on holiday last year. Moreover, the, the median response duration was about 15 months. I mean, that's really also um, unparalleled in a heavily pretreated population like this. And remember, all these patients had prior TDM1 and uh, two thirds had prior pertuzumab. 92% had visceral disease, 29% bone metastasis, 13% had brain metastasis. The sum of diameters of the target lesions was over five centimeters or greater than or equal to, I should say, five centimeters and half the patients. And yet we see these uh, extraordinary results. Uh, I'd like to comment uh, for a moment about those patients. There were 24 patients who had brain metastasis at baseline in this study. Um, and in that group, the overall response rate was similar to the intent to treat population, that is 58.3% compared to about 61% for the population as a whole. Moreover, the duration response was similar at about 17 months, and the median PFS was also similar to the intent to treat, uh, in this case, at 18.1 uh, months. So we saw at, at ESMO Breast 2020, um, the data that, that you're just describing with a, um, a CT scan of one patient who had a dramatic response in the brain uh, from trastuzumab deruxtecan. Do you, do you think that this antibody drug conjugate is truly crossing the blood-brain barrier? These are disrupted blood-brain barriers, these patients, or do you think that this is due to the, the chemo agent um, kind of the, what you're calling the bystander effect, some of it getting back out into the blood and then getting into the brain? Or, or do you think it's a combination of both? We know, Julie, that the backbone antibody, trastuzumab, if you label that with, um, with a, a PET label, 
uh, like a zirconium 89, for example, um, you can get very nice imaging of HER2 positive brain metastasis in human subjects. And so we know that uh, the antibody is able to get through these uh, fenestrations of the disrupted endothelial barrier in the tumor microenvironment in a brain metastasis. Moreover, we have data <clears throat> from a phase two trial done in Italy in over 50 patients with uh, HER2 positive brain metastasis uh, looking at TDM1. And ironically, in that trial, the intracranial response rate, which was about 30%, was similar to the extracranial response rate, which was about 35% in that uh, small phase two study. But again, it's evidence that these antibody drug conjugates like TDM1 can and do cross the blood-brain barrier and can even be associated with responses. So I will bet that um, this agent, trastuzumab deruxtecan, will similarly be able to uh, gain access to HER2-positive brain metastasis and affect responses. Um, but um, until we get larger numbers, um, we don't have as much information as we'd like to have yet for this agent. So uh, this drug is not without its toxicities. And uh, we know that um, we have a, a black box warning about interstitial lung disease and pneumonitis. And I, I think um, we've had a lot of conversation about this. There, it's rare. There are a handful of cases. We need to be really vigilant and what was very interesting was, um, you know, during the COVID era, as this drug was approved, I think there was some concern about would we be able to <laughs> distinguish if we were starting this drug in our patients between maybe a, a COVID-related pneumonia and a toxicity from uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan. Um, I have yet to see a case of it at our site. Um, uh, it um, it, it does get a black box warning though. It uh, seems to happen in less than 1% of patients, but we do need to be really alert because we've got to stop the drug quickly if it happens. Um, other common toxicities, we've talked about how um, as opposed to TDM1, uh, it, it does cause some alopecia and um, we've got to warn our patients about that. The, the typical chemo side effects such as nausea, fatigue, neutropenia, um, all exist. And uh, some diarrhea was also seen in these trials. So, um, you know, I've, I've talked with my patients about the side effects. Um, many of my patients who, you know, have been dealing with the HER2 metastatic disease for years and years and years, they've, they've had all of the other drugs um, up until uh, these few recent approvals. And um, we go over the side effects and they say, well, how they're not any worse for the most part than anything else you've been giving me for the past eight years. So I think if we put that in perspective, you know, with the balance of an extremely effective agent with tremendous response and very heavily pretreated patients, I think for the majority of our patients, the benefits will strongly outweigh the risks. Agreed. 